VJ Prashad, I'd like to talk to you about another book that you recently published, a selection of Ho Chi Minh's essays. It's called Selected Ho Chi Minh. I found it fascinating, including the introduction that you wrote to it. And speaking of the Soviet Union, one thing I did not realize is Ho Chi Minh's connection to Russian revolutionaries just a few years after the Re- Russian Revolution in 1917. You see, Ho Chi Minh comes from a basically a Confucian patriotic family in the center of Vietnam. And he, for good reason, is sent off um, to study in the French education system inside Vietnam. Um, because his father believes you've got to learn the best modern skills. And, you know, he's a free thinking man, actually, Ho Chi Minh's father. Eventually, he ends up in France and he's greatly disappointed um, by the failure of French republicanism. You know, the idea of liberty, equality, fraternity. Why is this not applying in the colonies? Racism plays a role. Um, all of that brutality. I mean, you know, the French colonial experience in Vietnam was marked by a great deal of violence. And Ho Chi Minh writes about that. He documents that while he's in France. Um But he's disappointed, you know, and in France, he meets the communists. And what interests him about them isn't Marx's writings and all that. He's fascinated by Lenin because Lenin um, makes some real advances for the left movement. Lenin makes the argument that all left movements must support the right of the colonies um, for independence. He, he doesn't hedge. He doesn't say that these places are backward and need to be governed. He's like colonies need to be independent. So and this in is fact, separate from what Marx would say. Well, Marx supported um, colonial uprisings, you know, in India and so on. So, but Marx never made a political judgment. He supported the uprisings. He wanted the Indians to defeat the British. You know, uh, he, he had very great compassion for suffering you know he was in favor of of um of the north in the u.s civil war because he wanted slavery to be uh, destroyed and wanted um the black workers in the united states to get complete freedom you know in capital marx writes that the worker in the white skin cannot be free uh, without the worker in the black skin being free you know it's a powerful line um so marx was not against it but he didn't conjure up a kind of political universe, uh, which Lenin did, because Lenin wrote these essays on the right of nations to self-determination in 1915 and 16. 1916, he wrote a text on imperialism. Um, a lot of this stuff was not available to Ho Chi Minh. He had not read them, but he had read articles about these ideas. So inspired, he went to Moscow, where after the revolution, he became a teacher at the School of the Toilers of the East in Moscow and was himself trained in Marxist ideas and in communist practice and so on. And there he basically commits himself to a life of liberating Vietnam because he says, look, and this is something he learned from his father. We don't want to return Vietnam to the monarchy. We don't want to go backward. We we don't want to restore the monarchy. We want to go forward. But unlike his father or that generation of nationalists, we don't want to establish French liberalism in Vietnam because French liberalism means the continuation of poverty for the people because he saw that in France. We want to transcend this. We want to create a kind of socialist Vietnam. That realization comes to him when he's in Moscow in the 20s and he sets up you know, the Vietnamese Workers Party and so on. See, uh, Mitch, I'll just put the camera back a little bit. One of the reasons I was very keen and started this project actually in 1996, a long time ago, I was very keen to do this book, Mitch, for a couple of reasons. One, Ho Chi Minh is not given the due consideration uh, that he deserves as a world historical figure. You know, he's an incredible person who led a people who were wretchedly poor to fight for their freedom and their liberation. Um, Just in terms of his history, there are several biographies of him, but really he's not 
up there in the pantheon, as it were. But secondly, I was very upset uh, in reading comments made by people about how somebody like Ho Chi Minh is not an original thinker. They are doers. I see this a lot. You know, Che Guevara, he's a doer. Fidel Castro, he's a doer. Um, you know, every time we encounter an African, Latin American, or m- most Asian leftists, they are considered people who do things, not who think. The only exception is Mao. That's why I said most Asians. Mao is the exception. And that's partly because from Mao came this tradition of Maoism around the world where people constructed a theory. But in fact, Ho Chi Minh was also creating a theory of the Vietnamese revolution. And I was very keen to lift this out. Um, There are people, and we've talked about this before, Jose Carlos Mariategui, trying to develop a theory of revolutionary movements in the Americas, where the indigenous people play a key role. That's in Mariategui's 1928 book. Um, Ho Chi Minh, because of his career, never had the time to sit and write a book. But that doesn't mean you don't have a theory. He's operating with a theory. So I wanted to select key texts, including his class notes from the classes he taught in China in 1927, uh, which had never been published outside Vietnam, outside Vietnamese, actually. It was translated for this book. Um, I wanted to select what I thought was a good collection of his writings, his letters, speeches to the elders, speeches to kids, to extract a theory of Ho Chi Minh's um, approach to the world. And that's what I really, I spent a lot of time, that's why it took so long to do, because I spent years and years trying to understand what is this man thinking? Um, not just what is he doing. It's not just a biographical uh, account. What is he thinking? Um, because after all, thought doesn't just happen in the Atlantic states. Thought also happens in Vietnam, in Burkina Faso, in Peru, and so on. And so I wanted to really spend time tending to this extraction of thought from a person's marginal and sometimes not so marginal writing. What was he thinking? Right. So he looked at Vietnam and he felt, look, frankly, there can be no um, advance in Vietnam unless the agricultural question is solved. Um, And related to that, there can be no agricultural reform unless Vietnam is free from imperialism. In other words, unless the Vietnamese economy is somehow cut off from its dependence on the West. So he began to develop an argument, which, you know, 25 years later will be also developed in Latin America, and it's called dependency theory. Um, It's the work of of, um, people in the Middle East, like Samir Amin and others. They, They came up with the same kind of ideas. His idea was that because the French dominate the economy, even if France leaves, French tentacles will be in the economy. So Vietnam has to have the ability to deal with its surplus in a way that is best for the development of the Vietnamese people. You can't reform agriculture if you're going to have so much of your wealth extracted from the country. So he began to put all these things together. Principle, therefore, for for Ho Chi Minh was the political sovereignty of Vietnam. And if you have political sovereignty, you can develop economic. That's why the war was so important. You know, that's why not surrendering to the French, not surrendering to the United States was imperative. They fought to the end. I mean, he fought to the end. He died in 1969, six years before Vietnam was reunited. But the reunification of Vietnam was there from 1945 when he goes into Hanoi and declares that Vietnam is free. Um, So he developed a theory for the development of Vietnam. Now, the tragedy is in 1975, six years after his death, when the United States left, Vietnamese agriculture was so destroyed, so polluted for generations, you know, beyond your and my life. I walked um, in the Ho Chi Minh Trail where people pointed and said, we'll never be able to grow anything on that land there. Never. You know, never meaning in the foreseeable human future. The land is completely saturated um, with chemical weapons. Uh, It's just nothing that you can grow things, but you can't eat it. You'll die. 
um, animals can't eat it they'll die uh, there are landmines all over the place and and you know it was hard to grow anything in vietnam so in 1975 vietnam immediately became reliant on the soviet union um which it was which it should not be because it's an extraordinarily fertile land um it's a beautiful country you know it's extraordinarily fertile highly inventive people um wonderful you know coastline that so many things could have been done there but you inherited a country in 75 where agriculture was a zero you know imagine that i mean not zero but it was far uh, more difficult to be self sustaining in so many things and so a poor country like that had to go into quote unquote opening the economy so many of the ideas of ho chi minh could never be put into practice not because you couldn't experiment with those ideas but because by the time vietnam was reunified 30 years after declaration of independence the land had been destroyed um so what's the point of land reform when the land itself doesn't exist when ho chi minh went to russia in the 20s did he get to meet and know vladimir lenin or was lenin already had already died by the time he got there well when ho chi minh arrived in um in moscow uh, lenin was incapacitated um he had had a series of strokes and you know spent a part of his life uh, pretty much not seeing people but ho chi minh was a nobody you know um he was a young person from uh the french you know communist movement who had been sent there and so on so he was a young guy he was living without proper shoes and he was terrified that his window would shatter with the moscow wind you know um i mean no he was not going around meeting the luminaries uh, but that was not really the point he was meeting other asian radicals that would have were important for his own development people like tan malaka from indonesia and so on this was important for his own development i must say in the records that we have um even the best biographies um we don't really know exactly what he was doing um because the records are not that great you know partly because he was not a some leading figure yeah. um you know the records are not that great on the other hand we have his own reflections he wrote a book while he was in moscow um a book on french colonialism which is a real indictment of of um the french behavior you know not just the numbers of wealth and so on but behavior the beatings the killings summary executions and so on um that really moved him you know and what's amazing much about that generation is ho chi minh had complete clarity about the brutality of the french and yet he was not against the french people um so interesting you know even in his i collected after independence in 45 he writes to the french who are living in vietnam and says you are we are welcome you to remain here you know we don't have any problem with you even though yesterday you were beating people and kicking them and shooting people with impunity we don't have a problem with you um th- this is the one thing about marxism what marxism gave a lot of these independence fighters is they didn't turn around and hate um it's really interesting they understood that structures put you in certain place and and so on you know um and i i appreciate this element of marxism marxism in its interpersonal um thing has a lot of problems i i grant that you know it can create a certain kind of arrogance as well and so on but in this there is something beautiful um ho chi minh was a beautiful man you know his letters to children his letters to the elderly he was really really interested and and this is the part of the theory that i wanted to emphasize he was really interested in how important it is to change the human personality um how important it was to create solidarity compassion what the vietnamese call collective mastery you know how we can learn to join with others to change things in the world um not allow technocracies you know technocrats to tell you what to do but how to build a process how to accompany each other by the way these phrases are all direct translations from spanish you know 
I accompany you in the struggle. I, I think that phrase is beautiful. And collective mastery is about accompaniment. You know, we will accompany each other in trying to change things. And and when you read his writings, there's a lot about ethics. There's a lot about this idea of changing behavior, um, which is so key for the experimentation of socialism. I don't know how he's seen globally, perhaps especially the, the global south, but at least in the Western world, he's not quite remembered as this icon, say, the way someone like Che Guevara is? Well, that's a pity. And that's what, in a very small way, I'm very much hoping to change. I'm a, I'm a super big proselytizer for Ho Chi Minh, you know, because uh, there's many reasons. One, I, I just find him to be a captivating person. Um, you know, he, he was also funny, you know. Um, he... He, he always smoked American cigarettes. He smoked Lucky Strikes. And he would say that, you know, that's my capitulation to the American. And when he talked to people, he would always play with the cigarette, unlit cigarette in his hand. And he would play with it, you know, in that way. I find that lovely. There was a Cuban filmmaker, uh, Santiago Alvarez, who went and made a movie in the last year of Ho Chi Minh's life called 69 Springs, 69 Primaveras. And he has this lovely video of Ho Chi Minh playing with a cigarette, talking to people and so on. Um, he was a great um, uh, talker. You know, he talked to people a lot. He listened a lot. Everybody who met him said he was a very keen, um, he was very curious about people and so on. These are things that I think it's important for young people who enter the left to learn about these figures. Um, that, you know, look, there's a phrase in Vietnamese that Ho Chi Minh used a lot called patriotic emulation. You know, you, you, you got a, a member of the left has got to present themselves in a certain way that other people want to emulate them. They want to be like them, you know. And I, I personally find the Ho Chi Minh that I know to be somebody worthy of emulation. And I want others to know him so that they too would learn to emulate him to be curious, to be kind, but also to be firm, you know, to, to be clear about what you're doing uh, without being arrogant. And, you know, sometimes on the left, we feel we cringe when we talk like that about emulation, you know, character, ethics, morality. He had no problem talking about morality, ethics, character, things like that. And the reason we have to talk about it is because we are also the clay that we come from. And that clay has to be transformed. We have to keep trying to be better people. Nothing, nothing other than that. And Ho Chi Minh teaches that. Talk to me about Ho Chi Minh's relationship to Mao Zedong. Yeah, so um, talk about the problems in the left. Um, you know, uh, Ho Chi Minh was in China for many, many years, you know, 20 years. Um, in and out of China and the Soviet Union and so on. He was in Hong Kong. He was in prison both in Hong Kong and in China, uh, Republican China. Uh, he saw firsthand the tension between the Gomindang, the Republican element, and the Communist Party. He experienced that firsthand. He knew the difficulties. And in his own movement, he was fortunate that the French came in and destroyed the nationalist organizations. So that all the nationalist energy went into the workers' movement. You know, that way Ho Chi Minh was lucky. Because the same thing didn't quite happen in, 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 in China, where the nationalists and the, and the communists continued to battle it out right till 1949, when the nationalists decamped to, Viet to Taiwan. Um, no, Ho Chi Minh was fortunate that, by and large, the nationalists were wiped out by the French um, in a kind of strategic mistake. Because the French didn't quite understand divide and rule. Anyway, um, he had a close relationship with the Chinese communists right up to, um, in a way, you know, the 1945 period. The Chinese communists assisted the Vietnamese. They helped build their party and so on. I think there were some differences that cropped up. But to be honest with you, Mitch, I don't actually think <coughs> these were between Mao and Ho Chi Minh or between the Vietnamese and the Chinese. Yes, in 1978, China and Vietnam fought a border conflict. 
but that had much more to do with the sino-soviet dispute uh vietnam was a very close ally of the soviet union um right you know from the 1945 period but intensified after 75 and the um the um chinese uh from at least 1972 you know one of the plans that henry kissinger and richard nixon tried to hatch was to make this alliance with the chinese to prevent resupplying across the china vietnam border um in the crucial last years of the war because i think kissinger's theory which is a is a pretty intelligent theory is if you can shut off the supply lines in the north then the vietnamese revolution cannot fight um against the united states of course they were wrong um because by 1972 73 the vietnamese didn't need resupplying from the north like they had earlier and you know they were able to defeat the united states in those years but there was a way in which the united states also was cultivating um its relationship with the chinese uh, to you know create problems between the two countries so i actually feel between mao and ho chi minh their personal relationship was not problematic at all but again um i don't think that um they saw each other either as adversaries or close allies or anything like that i mean you know in in this whole period um mao was an enormous figure after 1949 you know enormously major figure in world affairs and ho chi minh didn't have that kind of you know standing he was an interesting person is super humble guy and you know mao was a titanic figure and allowed himself to be even more titanic you see in the cultural revolution and so on but ho chi minh was against um allowing himself to become an icon Th- there was more iconography of ho chi minh in the new left movement in europe united states south america and so on um then ho chi minh in fact allowed in vietnam what were ho chi minh and mao's ideas of communism similar similar and when yes. we say maoism um, would 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 ho chi minh sort of see himself akin to ideas of maoism quote unquote see one thing is when you read the sections in the selections from ho chi minh himself about agricultural reform in vietnam there's a couple of things you'll find immediately firstly that um they built their theory from the facts so it wasn't that what's the theory and how do we apply it it's what is the facts on the ground and how do we use our values our basic conceptual apparatus you know the understanding of the role of the landless workers and so on the proletariat and so they build the theory from the facts secondly in those texts it's very clear that this is in the reforms in the 1950s in the northern part of vietnam agrarian reform that they are they have already studied what has happened in china and they try to avoid the mistakes of china so they write very openly in their party documents ho chi minh authors them i added them in the book where he refers directly says that in china this happened this is a good thing this is not and so on so it's not a question of is ho chi minhism like maoism it's that because they are parallel processes and they knew each other well and you know they had particularly the vietnamese followed the chinese historically even though vietnam the revolution is in 1945 4 years before in china the chinese accelerate land reform it's one of the great accomplishments of china um is the distribution of land the getting rid of landlordism and so on people don't understand getting rid of landlordism isn't just an economic act it's an act of social life then if you are a serf you are no longer bonded you are a human being you, know, you have capacities and so on it's an incredible civilizational change in the countryside when i first went to china with my mother in the 1980s um i remember comparing it adversely to india because in the chinese countryside 
um, you didn't see peasants hunched over, you know, bowing to people and so on. They were walking free. It wasn't a rich country, but I didn't see people slouched down and subservient and like you see it in India, where feudalism till today continues of that kind. Um, so in that sense, there was mutual learning, but I wouldn't put it to the fact that you know, there was a kind of set of ideas that were imposed because a very key thing you see both in Mao and in Ho Chi Minh is you got to build policy from the facts. And therefore, clarity about the facts is very important. And when you read either Mao on agriculture in 1927 or you read Ho Chi Minh, it's very clear that they are trying to analyze what is the actual reality on the ground. And therefore, based on that assessment, what do we want to change? How do we change it and so on? Finally, something I found fascinating was that Ho Chi Minh would translate a number of books, Russian books, or books written in Russian, or maybe even German as well, because I think he translated Marx and Bukharin into Vietnamese. He, he himself translated a number of books into Vietnamese. So that generation of communists were quite amazing. Um, Firstly, it's most likely that he translated them from French. Um, most likely that he translated from French. Again, we have very scant information. I would let you know. Some of it is from the existence of the text, letters, and so on. Um, that generation was amazing. They were in the middle of, I mean, we have that in India. You know, our leaders will be underground fighting to build some sort of peasant organization. And at night, they are sitting and translating into Malayalam, Marx Capital Volume 1. You know, uh, Initially, a lot of these translations were done, especially by Ho Chi Minh, for teaching in their schools, for political formation. That's why they did the translation. You know, you translate Bukharin ABC. Why? Because you want to use it as a textbook in your school. Um, so they were not translating for the sake of translation or for publication. They were translating for their political schools. Um, they had read a text, found it valuable, translated it. Um, and in that sense, these were pretty amazing people because, you know, leading a revolutionary process is not just about fighting to overthrow the, the past. It's also about building a core cadre of people, you know, who are going to go out there and organize. I mean, it's, it's a bunch of sad stories because the fruit of a generation trained by Ho Chi Minh in China were all killed by the French. You know, I tell some of their stories in the introduction. I mean, Hai and others, you know, they, they were trained in Moscow, trained in Ho Chi Minh schools, go to um, Saigon, uh, build an organization, start, you know, building trade unions and so on, picked up by the French, executed, and then before they executed, you know, they write on the walls of the prison cell, tell the party I was loyal to the end, or, you know, you know, whatever. They just these are incredible people. They, they killed at 27, killed at 28, killed really young, executed, you know, generation of them. Um, we don't have them in our historical memory, Mitch. Um, you know, a revolution doesn't just take place. Generations of people sacrifice themselves one way or the other. They give up personal advancement, career, and so on, family life. Um, there's a lot sacrificed toward building, you know, that new society that they dream of. Um, I, I, I feel very sad when I think about people like that, you know. Um, and these are people that they trained in these schools. Um, the training of Kada in schools is a key part of building a revolutionary process. And it's for that that he was translating. It's how to build this Kada, you know, taking people from um, rural areas with no education. You had to first teach them to read and write. Then you teach them the elements of building a political organization. They might learn some economics. They might learn some politics. So then they would say, what's the best book? Uh, here's a manual for this. Well, that's Bukharin. Let me translate that. Or might as well translate the Communist Manifesto. It's an inspirational text. Let them read it and so on. Um, they translated to build Kader. And they watched their Kader 
get killed. You can imagine the psychological impact that must have had, particularly because you know that somebody like Ho Chi Minh, such a compassionate person, would have cried every time he heard one more kill, and a generation was wiped out. Sounds like there's a book there to be written. You, you could call it the the translators. I am very much. I'm very keen on writing a young adult biography of Ho Chi Minh as a way of telling these kind of stories. Um, you know, the story of how do you build a process, um, and the importance of of can you imagine yourself in the shoes of Min Hai, for instance? You know. Um, where you have a child with another comrade, and then both of you are killed, um, assassinated, executed by the French. What happens to your child? I mean, Im- imagine that. Um, imagine the sacrifices people um, put. You know, the lives they put themselves through. Um, you know, the ones who die young. I mean, we see this in Colombia. Um, Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez have um, won the election. And, you know, I worry about their own safety. But Gustavo Petro, incoming president of Colombia, the first thing he said in his speech was he said, we are here because many people are not here. They have given their lives so that we can be here. You know, they have sacrificed their lives so that we can be here. Two, three hundred social movement leaders assassinated every year in Colombia. You know, and that's how he, he introduced himself. He's a political person. He recognizes that these victories come with a great deal of struggle and suffering. And we got to acknowledge that. But it's not just about the past. You want to build a process today, it's going to happen again. Vijay Prashad has been our guest. Again, Vijay Prashad is the director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. You could read the Institute's writings online at the tricontinental.org. He's the author of a number of books, a few of them quite new, including Learning from Movements for for Socialism. And he's also the editor of another book called Selected Ho Chi Minh. Vijay Prashad, thank you. Always a pleasure. Thanks a lot.